Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prista Bhutale Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Devi Gaur Navani Pracharne Nera Vishesha Shunyavadi Pastu Chade Chitarne Sri Krishna Chaitanya Pramanityananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Shivas Adi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hari Rama, Hari Rama, 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 Hari, Hari. Vanchika, Patrubias, Chakripa, Sindhu, Bhyavacha. Paditanam, Pavane, Bhyo, Vaishnava, Bhyo, Namo, Namaha. Yes, devotees, very good. Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Uh, okay, so let us read verses 5 and 6 together. It's, it's more or less a general introduction to the idea, I mean the section, to the idea of uh, everything being affected by, not just affected by, but everything being controlled by the modes of material nature. Yeah. So, uh, okay, let's, let's read verses 5 and 6. Those who undergo severe austerities and penances not recommended in the scriptures, performing them out of pride and egoism, who are impelled by lust and attachment, who are foolish and who torture the material elements of the body as well as the super-soul dwelling within, are to be known as demons. Oh, this is very heavy, isn't it? Yes, so uh, well, Srila Vishnu Chakravati Thakur says that Krishna says to Arjuna, you ask the question, what is the position of those who, giving up the rules of scripture, but uh, they have faith, and they're not simply enjoying as much as possible. Uh, they have some sort of faith and they perform some sort of worship according to, to that faith. So, so what's their position? Now, now hear the answer. <laughs> this is what Srila Vishnu Chakravati Thakur says that, that Lord Krishna says. Mm. So, so the Lord is answering in two verses then. What's the position of those who, they don't, they, they don't worship according to the scriptures, the, the authorized bona fide um, programs. They concoct some sort of worship which they have faith in. But it's just some some other sort of uh, of of worship. So what are they? Well, Krishna says here they're to be known as demons. Hare Krishna. And uh, in the purport, Srila Prabhupada talks about people who perform austerity. Where are we just a second? Um, oops. They perform austerities for, hmm. excuse me, this thing's misbehaving. Right, okay. Uh, Srila Prabhupada mentions that they have their own ideas, like he mentions right at the beginning there. For instance, fasting for some ulterior purpose, such as to promote a purely political end, is not mentioned in the scriptural directions. The scriptures recommend fasting for spiritual advancement, uh, not... <laughs> for some political end or, or some social purpose. 
just to ameliorate some material social conditions. Uh, and with respect, it seems that Prabhupada might be referring to Gandhi. It's possible. It may be. Yeah. Uh, so this, these types of things are not recommended. And if people do, like, uh, concocted austerities, if they do concocted austerities, um, then, then not only is it painful for the, the body of the person who's doing the austerities, but as Lord Krishna mentioned in the verse, it also disturbs the Supreme Personality of Godhead because he has lent us these bodies to use in his service and he's watching us constantly and if we uh, if we start going off on some other type of program then well maybe you've had the experience of lending something to someone because they say they need it for some you know, some important purpose. Uh oh. Oops. Yeah. They need it for some important purpose. But then after a little while, you happen to see them using it just in some other way, which was not agreed. So that's disturbing. Uh, if people cheat like that. So, uh, Prabhupada says that the, this unauthorized fasting or austerity in the, in the middle of the purport, Prabhupada says, a demoniac person may think he can force his enemy or some other party to comply with his desire by fasting, but sometimes the person dies. From this fasting, yes, uh, these things happen. I remember many years ago when I was in England, it was actually in, in the 70s, and yeah. in Northern yeah. Ireland, one man, revolutionary yeah. I, IRA man, Bobby Sands, it was on the front pages of the papers. It was just all over. He uh, decided to fast to death. And... You know, until the British gave some concessions to the, the Irish people, the British did not do it, and the gentleman died. So, <laughs> these things happen. Yeah, so Robert says that actually the, these acts are not approved by the Lord, and Robert says... They, they are insults. They are insults to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Well, this is really, and this is very intense. Prabhupada is being really very intense. Uh, and Prabhupada goes on to say, persons of normal condition must obey the scriptural injunctions. Those who are not in such a position neglect and disobey the scriptures and manufacture their own way of austerities and penances. What can you say? Uh, so, yeah. You know... So as Krishna has said, and, and Prabhupada has repeated it a few times now, uh, and in the previous verse, the whole, the whole, I mean the previous chapter, the whole chapter was on this subject, 
that um, people who have all sorts of ulterior motives and and material desires, and they try they try to use whatever means they can to achieve their ends, even use religion. They're demons. They're demons. So Srila Baladev Vijabhushan says that it is understood that they cannot avoid the unfortunate destinations described in the previous chapter. Mm, mm, mm. It's not good. So Srila <clears throat> Prabhupada concludes the chapter by saying, if however such persons are fortunate enough to be guided by a spiritual master who can direct them to the path of Vedic wisdom, they can get out of this entanglement and ultimately achieve the supreme goal. It's possible. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a lot is possible, actually, by the mercy of Krishna, uh, if one gets the mercy of the devotees. <clears throat> if one gets the mercy of the devotees, a lot can be achieved. Therefore, therefore, if one takes shelter of the bona fide spiritual master and the bona fide devotees, then either, even someone who otherwise would be called a demon uh, can become completely corrected and get onto the path back home, back to Godhead, and go back to Godhead. Okay, so let's see. Verse 7. Uh, now, this verse 7, it's interesting, it's important, in that it is introducing what is going to be discussed for the last, it's something, the next, I'd say at least 10 or 12, no, it's more like, at least 12 verses, or maybe slightly more. But it's at least 12. Yeah. So, in verse 7, then, Lord Krishna says, Even the food each person prefers is of three kinds, according to the three modes of material nature. The same is true of sacrifices, austerities, and charity. Now hear of the distinctions between them. So this, this is a very interesting part of Bhagavad Gita. Everyone likes prasadam. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> Only some really weird person. Too weird. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so foods and the modes. Foods which people who are in the different modes find themselves attracted to. So this is, uh, this is now from verse 8 to verse 10. Uh, foods and the modes. And the idea, the idea behind all this is to be able to recognize what mode a person's in, and particularly oneself. <laughs> yes. So they're known as foods in the modes because they're dear to people who are in the different specific modes. And they, they also uh, have the particular natures of the, the different modes. Yes, they, the foods also have the different natures of the different modes. So some foods are in goodness, they're very pleasant, and they have that sort of effect on the, the body and the psychology, the whole system. Some foods are in the mode of, of, of passion, and they're strong. 
and they really sort of give a certain type of energy. And others, other types of foods are in ignorance and they're just sort of kind of dead and dull, more like that. Okay, so let's go through then. Uh, let's read the three verses, 8, 9, and 10 first. 8. Foods dear to those in the mode of goodness increase the duration of life, purify one's existence, and give strength, health, happiness, and satisfaction. Such foods are juicy, fatty, wholesome, and pleasing to the heart. Nine, foods that are too bitty, too bitter, foods that are too bitter, too sour, too salty, hot, pungent, dry, and burning are dear to those in the mode of passion. Such foods cause distress, misery, and disease. Food, 10. Food prepared more than three hours before being eaten. Food that is tasteless, decomposed, and putrid. And food consisting of remnants and untouchable things. So that sort of food is dear to those in the mode of darkness. Mode of darkness means the mode of ignorance. All right, so let's go through and you see where you fit into the scheme of things. <laughs> okay, so eight. Foods dear to those in the mode of goodness increase the duration of life, purify one's existence, and give strength, health, happiness, and satisfaction. Such foods are juicy, fatty, wholesome, and pleasing to the heart. Mm. Right, so... Uh, yeah, so the, these are foods which are liked by people in the mode of goodness. And those foods have a nature of goodness. And if you eat them, if you eat them nicely, you know, of course, they must be nicely prepared. They must be clean. They must look nice is also very good. Being very nicely cooked and served nicely if, if everything involved is in the mode of goodness like that, then the person who is eating will gravitate, will be influenced towards the mode of goodness. You know, of course, having said that, having said that, if you eat too much of anything, like milk, Milk is in the mode of goodness. But if you just drink too much milk, uh, you'll get sick. Vegetables are in the mode of goodness. At least the, the majority, you could say, many types of vegetables are in the mode of goodness. Fruits. But if you eat too much of anything, then you will, I mean, too much even of things in the mode of goodness, then uh, you'll get into passion or ignorance and or ignorance. Uh, yeah, Srila Vishnu Chakravati Thakur comments, <clears throat> it is well known that sattvic foods increase the lifespan. They also increase strength of will, as well as physical strength, freedom from disease, happiness, and delightfulness in eating them. The food should be tasty or juicy. And he gives some examples here. Jaggery, gua, gua, um, has taste, 
but is coarse and dry. Yeah. Sattvic food should thus be mild with some oil. The foam of milk, though t- tasty and mild, <clears throat> is insubstantial. <clears throat> Sattvic food should be substantial with long-lasting effects on the body. <laughs> Here's something interesting. Uh, jackfruit a- and other items are sweet, mild, and substantial, but are not beneficial to the stomach. How's that? I've never liked jackfruit. Don't ask me why, but anyway, yeah. Uh, Right, okay. So, so jackfruit is not beneficial to the stomach and other organs. Sattvic food should thus be beneficial to the heart, stomach, and other organs as well. Thus it's understood that foods such as rice, wheat, other grains, milk, and sugar are dear to the sattvic people because they have all four of the above-mentioned qualities. Yeah, that they're tasty or juicy, they, they are uh, mild, they have long-lasting effects on the body, and they're beneficial to the heart and various other organs. Uh, yes, so, uh, you know, you'll see that devotees, of course, generally our diet, particularly when you're living in a temple well, you know, but it should be. They're generally, it, the prasadam's more in the mode of, of goodness. All right, number nine, foods that are too bitty, bitter, too sour, salty, hot, pungent, dry, and burning <clears throat> are dear to those in the mode of passion. Such foods cause distress, misery, and disease. And we should note the use of the word too, too bitter, too sour, too salty, too hot, too pungent. Yeah, like this. In other words, there is a place for such foods in a mode of goodness or Krishna conscious diet, but not excessively. You know, we we just read about food in the mode of goodness that milk and sugar, sugar is in the mode of goodness. But like we mentioned, if you eat too much of anything, it'll have detrimental effects. I mean, anything which is generally considered in the mode of goodness, goodness, uh, even though it's Generally, in the mode of goodness, if you have too much, it'll put you in some other mode, passion or in- ignorance. Aha! Well, let me just tell you an interesting, I find it interesting, little point. Listen to this one. <laughs> the other day, oh, I forget, last week, sometime. Mother Bhakti Devi, who is so kind to cook lunch for me every day, she made for me some stuffed jalapeno chilies. <laughs> stuffed with some sort of, I don't know, cream cheese, or I think, I think it was cream cheese, something like that. So some heat was there. But not, not that I'm just in the mode of passion, because I'm not. But everyone's partly in the mode of passion, of course. So I found those chilies to be like nectar. <laughs> I, I have such, my, my physical system is such 
that to some degree chili tastes sweet, to some degree salt tastes sweet. There's a particular name for the type of person for whom salt tastes sweet. It's, it's a known phenomenon. Uh, the point, though, here was too much. You know, Prabhupada generally would always have some chili in his sabji dal like that. Not a lot, because that'll throw the system out, but he would generally have some, at least. I remember... One program, the first, actually first, I must say. First program I went to of some Indian people in London. And, and they served, you know, food or prasadam or whatever at the end. And everything had red chili powder in it. There was a fruit salad. It had red chili powder in it. And I thought, wow. Who are these people? <laughs> what sort of people do we have here? Anyway, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. In India, in Vrindavan, on a few occasions, I've been in a place where <clears throat> there was a Parikrama party of us and some people organized uh, food or prasadam. It was offered. Uh, cooked by professional Brahmin cooks. And, you know, these people are expert. And at least one of the times I remember, the sabji, there was sabji rice dal, and maybe, I think that was about it, and maybe a sweet. And the sabji was so incredibly hot. Just so hot. Even you had little tiny bit and mixed it with, with some uh, rice. It was just too hot. It was just too hot. Okay. Well, let's just... Uh, Srila Vishnu Chakravati Thakur makes a comment here. In this, the, the, in this list, the adjective extremely, or as Prabhupada says, too much, too extremely, should be added to each quality. Very bitter food means such food as neem. Very sour, very salty, and very hot foods are well known. Very sharp foods are turmeric root and other items or pepper. I don't know if he means chili or what he means exactly. Very drying foods are hing and kodrava. Kodrava is a form of, if you're familiar with, millet. A form of millet. It dries, sort of sucks liquid out of the system. Burning foods are those that cause internal heat, such as burned chickpeas. These cause suffering, lamentation, and disease. Uh, the word suffering here refers to suffering when eating, causing pain to the tongue, throat, or other organ. Lamentation means afterward in the future. Those foods cause despair, and then they cause disease. Verse 10. Food prepared more than three hours before being eaten. Food that is tasteless, decomposed, and putrid. And food consisting of remnants and untouchable things is dear to those in the mode of darkness, in the mode of ignorance. Yeah, so Prabhupada gives an extensive purport, and he explains the only purpose of food, really, uh, the real purpose of food is to increase the duration of life, purify the mind, and give bodily strength. Uh, then Prabhupada gives an in-depth analysis of 
uh, different types of foods. I think we got to read through this here. We got to read through this, or part of it at least. Okay, in the past, great authorities selected those foods that best aid health and increase life's duration, such as milk products, sugar, rice, wheat, fruits, and vegetables. These foods are very dear to those in the mode of goodness. Some other foods, such as baked corn and molasses, while not very palatable in themselves, can be made pleasant when mixed with milk or other foods. They are then in the mode of goodness. All these foods are pure by nature. They're quite distinct from untouchable things like meat and liquor. Fatty foods, as mentioned in the eighth verse, have no connection with animal fat obtained by slaughter. Animal fat is available in the form of milk, which is the most wonderful of all foods. Milk, butter, cheese, and similar products give animal fat in a form which rules out any need for the killing of innocent creatures. It is only through brute mentality that this killing goes on. <clears throat> the civilized method of obtaining needed fat is by milk. Slaughter is the way of subhumans. That's a good one. Protein is amply available through split peas, split peas, dal, whole wheat, etc. Right, okay. So that's all there in the first paragraph. We then, uh, we, we go into the second paragraph. Let's have a look here. Well, yeah, uh, Prabhupada talks about how food cooked more than three hours before. Um, if it's prasadam, it's all right. It's not just all right, it's transcendental. Um, Prabhupada doesn't mention here specifically, no. He doesn't specifically mentioned here, but, but we do recall in Chaitanya Charitamrita <coughs> how uh, every year when devotees would come to visit Lord Chaitanya and stay for some months and for the Ratha Yatra in Puri, then they would bring different foodstuffs for the Lord. And, and a lot, there was a room sort of like a spare room somewhere there where Lord Chaitanya was staying. And that room was full of all these, their clay pots stacked up on top of each other. And Lord Chaitanya, you know, he was not, he was not a voracious eater at all. So, and, but the devotee, the devotees who cooked, they would invariably ask Lord Chaitanya's servant Govinda, did the Lord like what we prepared? <laughs> and Govinda would have to say, oh yes, he loved it, thank you very much. Whereas actually the Lord had not eaten any of those things. So they sort of stockpiled over a year and in the end, Raghava, I mean uh, Govinda, told Lord Chaitanya that I cannot go on lying to the devotees like this. What, what to do? I don't know what to do about all this food which is just accumulated. Then Lord Chaitanya, you know, some of it had been there for a year. Now you must know, any food which is sitting exposed to the atmosphere for one year, it'll be real, it will have gone way off, way hopelessly off. But 
all this food was okay. And Lord Chaitanya ate a whole room full of prasadam. And then uh, Govinda was able to tell the devotees, oh, the Lord appreciated it. Because that's transcendental. We are, we are not transcendental like that. If we uh, have some prasadam, which has somehow or other been left for some time, and therefore it sort of materially decayed, de deteriorated, gone rotten, you might say, to some degree. Uh, because we are not transcendental, if we try to eat such foodstuffs, then we will get sick because we're not on that, that platform. So, yeah. Yeah, so remnants, remnants are mentioned. Remnants are all right. Remnants are good. If they're remnants of food eaten by the deity, eaten by some great devotee, we want those remnants. We want those remnants. I remember when Srila Prabhupada would visit Bhaktivedanta Manor and he'd be staying in his rooms there and in the evening some prasadam would be brought to him and, well, in the morning particularly actually, we would, some of us would gather outside Prabhupada's room, rooms and he would have some prasadam, then the remnants would come out. And we would be <laughs> eager to get it. Not only eager, but Prabhupada, particularly in the morning, he would get oranges, or an orange, or maybe a couple even, which where the orange has just been cut, and the skin is still there. And he would suck the juice out and then leave the skin. And that was like the, the specialty which we, we always wanted to get. And we would, we would just eat, oops, we would eat the apple, the uh, orange peel very happily. Hare Krishna. So therefore, we should just take prasadam. We should just take prasadam. Uh, I'm just going to remind you, I'm just going to remind you what Lord Kapila says in Srimad Bhagavatam, which we read actually, going back what? Uh, I think it, must, it was the 14th chapter we read about devotional service in the modes. So, mode of ignorance. Devotional service executed by a person who's envious, proud, violent, and angry, and who is a separatist, is considered to be in the mode of darkness, ignorance, passion. The worship of deities in the temple by a separatist with a motive for material enjoyment, fame, and opulence, is devotion in the mode of passion and goodness. When a devotee worships the Supreme Personality of Godhead and offers the results of his activities in order to free himself from the inebrities of fruit of activities, his devotion is in the mode of goodness. And then, so that's... That's the mode of goodness. That's the mode of goodness. It's not pure devotional service. Then, then he defines pure devotional service. The manifestation of unadulterated devotional service is exhibited when one's mind is at once attracted to hearing the transcendental name and qualities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead who's residing in everyone's heart. Just as the water of the Ganges flows naturally down towards the ocean, 
such devotional ecstasy, uninterrupted by any material condition, flows towards the Supreme Lord. Right, okay. So now we are going on, devotees, to the third section, which is about sacrifices in the modes. And it's from verse 11 to 13. Okay, so I'll read the verses. Of sacrifices, the sacrifice performed according to the directions of Scripture as a matter of duty by those who desire no reward is of the nature of goodness. And th uh, 12, but the sacrifice performed for some material benefit or for the sake of pride, O chief of the Bharatas, you should know to be in the mode of passion. And verse 13, any sacrifice performed without regard for the directions of Scripture, without distribution of prasadam, spiritual food, without chanting of Vedic hymns, and without remunerations to the priests, and without faith, is considered to be in the mode of ignorance. Wow, okay. So these are sacrifices. So let's have a look at verse 11. Of sacrifices, the sacrifice performed according to the directions of Scripture as a matter of duty by those who desire no reward is of the nature of goodness. So, uh, let's see. So this person may or may not be a devotee. You know, it's a little difficult to say. Could, could be a devotee. Could not be a devotee also. A devotee would generally be on an even higher level, at least a, you know, sort of really fixed up devotee. But devotees may be like this also. Uh, so Prabhupada explains, one should go to a temple or church as a matter of duty only, offer respect to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and offer flowers and eatables. Everyone thinks that there is no use in going to the temple just to worship God, but worship for economic benefit is not recommended in the scriptural injunctions. One should go simply to offer respect to the deity. That will place one in the mode of goodness. Twelve. But the sacrifice performed for some material benefit or for the sake of pride, O chief of the Bharatas, you should know to be in the mode of passion. So, uh, Srila Prabhupada says, Sometimes sacrifices and rituals are performed for elevation to the heavenly kingdom or for some material benefits in this world. Such sacrifices or rit ritualistic performances are considered to be in the mode of passion. We have a special question for those of you doing Bhakti Shastri based on this verse 12. Uh, it is from a letter on Ju July 6th, 1968, from Montreal to one Vinod Patel. July 6th, 1968, you should write that down if you're doing Bhakti Shastri. Uh, yeah, so in the letter, Srila Prabhupada says, they can do lots of lucrative business for material benefit, but you should know that we're not doing any business for material benefit. Gagamuni spends his profit for Krishna consciousness. 
Generally, people are inclined to do business or make profit for sense gratification. Such tendency is the cause of material bondage. But to act for Krishna is the cause for opening the door for liberation. So the question is, who is this letter written to? <coughs> is it Gagamuni? Is it Vinod Patel? Is it to, to Tamal Krishna? Is it to Krishna Nandini? Hare Krishna, who just passed away a few days ago, my Lord. Correct answer, of course, is Vinod Patel. 13. Any sacrifice performed without regard for the directions of Scripture, without distribution of prasadam, spiritual food stuff, without chanting of Vedic hymns, and without remuneration to the priests, and without faith, is considered to be in the mode of ignorance. So Prabhupada says, faith in the mode of darkness or ignorance is actually faithlessness. <clears throat> Sometimes people worship some demigod just to make money and then spend the money for recreation, ignoring the scriptural injunctions. Such ceremonial shows of relig religiosity are not accepted as genuine. They're all in the mode of darkness. They produce a demoniac mentality and do not benefit human society. Wow, that's interesting, isn't it? Prabhupada says, they produce a demoniac mentality. Uh, some sacrifice or some worship in the mode of ignorance which has these characteristics, non-shastric, no prasad, no Vedic hymns, no remuneration to the priests, and no faith. They produce a demoniac mentality and don't benefit anyone. Okay, now, austerity in the modes. This is a slightly different idea, just slightly. Uh, it's a longer section from verse 14 to verse 19 because it's structured differently. It's actually, uh, it's talking about austerity in, in three divisions, three divisions of austerity. Uh, austerity of the body, austerity of speech, and austerity of the mind. Yeah. And that's from 14 to 16. And they, they are progressively more difficult. Body, speech, and mind. Progressively more difficult. Yeah. Then... Well, let's just have a very quick look here. What now? Okay, well, anyway. Uh, the whole section has been put together, actually. Yeah. So let, let's read through. Let's three, read through these verses. In, in 14, 15, and 16, there's discussion about austerity of the body in 14, then of speech in 15, then the mind in 16. Anyway, let's read through. Austerity of the body consists in worship of the Supreme Lord, the Brahmins, the spiritual master, and superiors like the father and mother, and in cleanliness, simplicity, celibacy, and nonviolence. 15. Austerity of speech. The last verse was austerity of body. Now, austerity of speech. What is it? Consists in speaking words that are truthful, pleasing, beneficial, and not agitating to others. And also in regularly 
uh, reciting Vedic literature. Then austerities of the mind, satisfaction, simplicity, gravity, self-control and purification of one's existence are austerities of the mind. So now, in the next three verses, Krishna is going to talk about doing, doing these three austerities um, in goodness, passion, or ignorance. These three together in goodness, or in passion, or in ignorance. Okay, let's, let's read the verses, 17, 18, 19. This threefold austerity performed with transcendental faith by men not expecting material benefits but engaged only for the sake of the supreme is called austerity in goodness. 18. Penance performed, penance means austerity, uh, out, performed out of pride and for the sake of gaining respect, honor, and worship is said to be in the mode of passion. It is neither stable nor permanent. Then, verse 19, penance performed out of foolishness with self-torture or to destroy or injure others is said to be in the mode of ignorance. Okay, so let's just quickly go through these. It's kind of, uh, sort of, I would say, Self-evident, really. 14. Austerity of the body consists in worship of the Supreme Lord, the Brahmins, the spiritual master, and superiors, like the father and mother, and in cleanliness, simplicity, celibacy, and non-violence. <clears throat> yes. So, well, that's pretty uh, straightforward. I could just mention celibacy. Celibacy is... Uh, th there are eight divisions of celibacy. Did you know that? One should not think of women, speak about sex life, dally with women, look lustfully at women, talk intimately with women, or decide to engage in sexual intercourse. Nor, nor should one endeavor for sex life or engage in sex life. Uh, anyway, yeah, celibacy. Celibacy is a very important and valuable principle if nicely executed in Krishna consciousness. Uh, okay, 15. Austerity of speech consists in speaking words that are truthful, truthful, pleasing, beneficial, not agitating to others, and in regularly reciting Vedic literature, which for us means reading Prabhupada's books. That's what it means, actually. Um, Srila Prabhupada explains truthfulness and being pleasing as speaking to those who are one's students. Isn't that interesting? Uh, if someone is not your student, then you shouldn't speak as it may upset them. And this is austerity or penance regarding speech. And obviously, one shouldn't speak nonsense. Um, one must speak on, on the basis of Scripture and the instructions of the spiritual master uh, in a nice, pleasing way. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, by such discussions, one may derive the highest benefit and elevate human society. There's a limitless stock of Vedic literature and one should study this. This is called penance of speech. And Baladeva Vijabhushan says that such austere speech 
does not cause fear at all in anyone. Uh, and then austerities of the mind, satisfaction, simplicity, gravity, self-control, and purification of one's existence are the austerities of the mind. Prabhupada mentions austerity of the mind means to detach it from sense gratification. Prabhupada says satisfaction of the mind can be obtained only by taking the mind away from thoughts of sense enjoyment. The more we think of sense enjoyment, the more the mind becomes dissatisfied. In the present age, we unnecessarily engage the mind in so many different ways for sense gratification. And so there's no possibility of the mind's becoming satisfied. Simplicity, Prabhupada gives a little definition. One is always thinking of self-realization. Silence means that one is always thinking of self-realization. The person in Krishna consciousness observes perfect silence in the sense. Self-control of the mind means detaching the mind from sense enjoyment. Purification of one's existence. Prabhupada says one should be straightforward in his dealings and thereby purify his existence. Yeah, okay. And now verses 17, 18, and 19. 17. This threefold austerity performed with transcendental faith by men not expecting material benefits, but engaged only for the sake of the Supreme, is called austerity and goodness. <coughs> so if you do these three austerities of body, speech, and mind in this way, you're in goodness. Uh, Yes. So then, austerity penance performed out of pride for the sake of gaining, gaining respect, honor, and worship is said to be in the mode of passion. It's neither stable nor permanent. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah, if they're just for attracting people, impressing people, then Prabhupada says, people in passion arrange to be worshipped by subordinates and let them wash their feet and offer riches. Hari <laughs> Right. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, the results are temporary. They can be continued for some time, but they are not permanent. And both Vishnath Chakravati Thakur and Srila Baladeva Jibhushan say, the results are not only not permanent, they may not even come at all. And 19, penance performed out of foolishness with self-torture or to destroy or injure others is said to be in the mode of ignorance. So the example is given of Hiranya Kashipu doing his famous austerities <clears throat> to become immortal, kill the demigods, take over the universe, and all of that sort of stuff. But it's tamasic. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, to undergo penances for something which is impossible is certainly in the mode of ignorance. Hare Krishna. Okay, devotees. So, very good. We'll see you tomorrow evening, same time, same place. Thank you all very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Kejai.